Yeah, I appreciate all your emphasis on um, even as we pray for people's physical well-being. I appreciate the emphasis on things eternal and um, spiritual that will ultimately last. So, disciples, are you ready to uh, to prepare yourself this morning and uh, for God to work in you to um, to serve it? Yes. 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 Good. Good. So let's let's do that this morning. As Kyle mentioned in his in his prayer, I I've, I've been asking for uh, revival. But this is kind of a prelude to um, a devotional I'm going to do in a couple of weeks. What I found is that God expects you to participate with Him uh, if you're going to be revived. <laughs> that He doesn't just say zap. You're revived. That he expects, as Scott, what Scott talked about in his sermon this morning, he expects service, obedience, time in his word, and prayer. In fact, it's an interesting thing about prayer, I think, that in this country particularly, that even unbelievers will often talk about prayer and even pray, though they say they don't believe. So prayer has kind of a universal appeal in that way, but the way that a disciple prays is probably going to be very different from, a way, from the way that someone who is not a believer prays. And that's what we're going to look at as we continue looking at the life of Paul. So here's the question. At a church where he was the lead minister, Francis Chan told ministers on staff that anyone who spent less than an hour in prayer a day was asked to leave. Now, I, I don't know what you think about that. I'm not really, that's not really what our question is going to be about. But he obviously thought prayer was important. What's so important about prayer? What's so it's a direct link to God. All right, it's a direct link to God. And so if I want to be linked to God, I need to be engaged in prayer. Everybody hear that? If I want to be linked to God, I need to be engaged in prayer. What, what else is important about prayer? So the one point. What do you mean, sorry, lifeline? Direct communication. I mean, we can't seem physically like we're looking at you. Uh -huh. Like, we know he's there, but our lifeline comes to where we can connect with him, we can ask him for help, for forgiveness, and to uh, just direct. Okay, very good. So, that relationship is sustained. With God, at least partially by prayer. What else makes prayer so important? So, if, if, if there's a humbling aspect to prayer that I recognize my dependency on Him, what else? I think God knows your heart. That he wants you to tell him what's on your heart. I think he wants us to, again, maybe what Lori's saying, acknowledge he wants to hear what's on your heart. He wants you to verbalize what's on your heart, even though he already knows. I mean, you, you've probably heard the, the old joke the, the, the wife who became frustrated with her husband. They've been married for 30 years and, and, uh, he said, she said, you, you never tell me you love me. And he said, I told you on the day we were married, and if I changed my mind, I would love you. I mean, most women would not be content with that, right? Yeah. You, think God, you think God's less content with that? So that connection, that affirmation of relationship is important. I think it's particularly important for ministers, and that's where, again, the question is born out of, because um, 
Prayer keeps you near God so that you can gain power from Him. I'm going to tell you, I think that too much in the name, too much is done in the name of Jesus Christ by our own power and plan. And I've been guilty of it. Okay? I've been guilty of it. You know, we'll, we'll engage in a discussion about something that, that needs to be done or something that we're wanting to uh, uh, to ask for God's blessing on. And we'll do all this planning and talking and discussing and dreaming and stuff. And then at the end, we'll tack on a prayer. What about beginning? We're going to talk about that a little bit more. How about beginning there? Uh, remember when Jesus was um, getting was ascending back to heaven? He said, "Don't don't, don't share the message." I mean, they, they were all witnesses. They were witnesses. They they knew what they'd seen, but Jesus said, "Don't show the mess share the message until you get power from on high." It's that connection uh, that that the Lord wants us operating from and not just to not just to say give me but also to listen to him as he speaks to us in prayer <clears throat> I, mean, I don't know what your experience has been but there are, are many occasions where I'll be praying and I'll pray about something and, or praying for someone and and here's what I'll hear and again, it's not an audible voice. It's the Spirit speaking. And he says, here's what I want you to do. Keep you there. In fact, there have been prayers that I, and, and I know of other people's stories, where they have been the answer to their own prayer. Okay? God help that person? Oh, you're wanting to use me to help that person. So we become the answer to our own prayer in that way. So it's it, prayer is very important. So here's the question next. How would you rate your prayer life and explain? How, about, how, how are you doing? Good. What, what do you explain? Well, you know, this, uh, I will be honest. Uh, it was a morning thing to talk to God on the way to work in my car to talk. Mm -hmm. I don't go to work. I go home. Mm -hmm. So at home, my routine has changed to where I'm up and I'm badly trying to get connected to get to work so that I can work. And it's like my whole focus has been directed in, in that so that I'm not talking to God. Um, it's totally different. Now I do find myself talking to him throughout the day because of, of my job. There are people I talk to that, I, that they're on my heart. They, I, their stories are very troubling yeah. a lot of times. So I, I find myself in that respect. But I'm not really praying. I'm talking to him, but I'm not so honestly, you're disappointed with where you are right now. Okay, someone else. How's, how's your prayer life? And you know, if it's good, you're probably reluctant to say, "You know, I've got a great prayer life," because it sounds like you're boasting. You know, but where are you? Explain. I think almost all of us can say we need improvements. As a matter of how healthy it is, you can always make it better. But you know, kind of going back to her thought about. Prayer throughout the day. I don't know if I would get a whole lot of it done if that's not how I did it. <laughs> I mean, it's just, you know, it's one of those things. I mean, why, there's nothing wrong with stopping partway through the day and saying, you know, I just talked to so and so or they, they popped up in my head and I'm going to say a little prayer for them today. You know, I mean, even as you're scrolling through your Facebook feed or you get a message from somebody, I mean, those are the times when it's okay to pray specifically. To them, but yes, I also understand too that I like structure and I like to have that part of my day that I set aside, but sometimes it just doesn't happen. We're going to come back to that thought. Um, what, is, what does prayer look like? 
uh, in just a moment. Others. Well, is there really a a difference as far as talking to God throughout the day? And I never thought that we really had to have a real formal setting, you know, and to talk to, to God. I mean. You don't think you have to come up to the church building and no. maybe have me bless you or something like that? <laughs> or start with the Heavenly Father. Wow. Heavenly. <laughs> <laughs> and put all these nows and all that kind of stuff in there. I, I, I don't do that. I don't do that. But I'm constantly talking to them throughout the day and the night. Okay. Others? Something that I found that works really well is for the last uh, six 2007, for, for four of us women to get together. We used to do it every week and then it got to every other week and it's once a month. But, and then we write down what our prayers are for each other. And so in the morning when I pray, I have those prayers in front of me. And then I have a book that I read that gets me into <laughs> thoughts of what I want to pray about. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. David, David Jeremiah has just a devotional. And I read that devotional just to get my mind on that. And then I have a prayer book that I write and every four months I change it, but I write specifically what I want to pray for each person in my family or if I'm praying for salvation, Jacob's on that list. Um, you know, for certain people, I have it written down. And um, and then what helps me because it increases my faith is when those prayers are answered. And I started just this last couple of months writing down blessings, mm. all the blessings that God has given me. And I go back and I give thanks to Him and praise to Him for that. And then um, so, um, but when prayers are answered, I write it down. And then I've I've done that for years. And so I go back and I look at that and I say, see how He's been so faithful. So it's helped my faith. Teresa's talking a, a lot about the structure and um, <clears throat> consistency of prayer and how how helpful that is. Which leads us to the next question, which which is what does a, a strong, healthy prayer life look like? What does it look like? I'm not really niche on that, but purposeful. What is what is what is a purposeful prayer life look like? Uh, it's just like when you you take the time, you know, like on a daily basis to you know pray for certain people, and even though I haven't seen her in a while, you know, I, I see that in Billy a lot. Yeah. You know. Yeah, she's she's definitely a prayer warrior. Well, like any relationship, uh, prayer must be regular. Yeah. And, and I want to suggest these few things about what a healthy prayer life looks like. It, it's not strictly self-focused. Uh, it focuses on the most important things, uh, which is spiritual things. Um, it's full of gratitude. It's full of praise. It's focused on God's kingdom more than it's focused on your kingdom. Now, I think God cares about, um, I think God cares about things that are going on in our life, but I think he wants us to care about things that are going on in his will. Don't you think? So, you know, to learn how to pray for those things, I think just by observation is where a lot of people feel challenged. Uh, that they can come up with a with a please give me list, but to pray for the things that, that are on God's heart and are God's purposes and are God's will is where a lot of people are challenged, have a harder time. And, and maybe that fits you. Maybe that describes you. But you know what Teresa talked about is one thing that I would suggest to you too, and that is to make a prayer list. Um, I've got I've got a prayer list that includes headings like physical illness and, and, and physical well-being, but I I have people that I intercede for, and that that list is is a hodgepodge of things because there's all okay. I May mean, I pray for Scott and LCU as part of that, 
but I also pray for the young man who's uh, who's, a, who's a new dad who's struggling to to figure out how to be a good dad. So it's it's a hodgepodge of things. I pray for uh, prayer. There's a, a list of things I'm thankful for that includes my family and, and a lot of other things. There are um, personal ways that I want to grow out to, to love like Jesus loves. Um, there are marriages and families that I pray about in, in their relationship. That's a whole different thing. There's outreach opportunities that I pray for that, that people are on that list. And so I think that kind of, of structure and that kind of consistency can help enhance and strengthen your prayer life. And I'm a very visual person, so I'll, I visualize when I'm praying. I visualize being in the presence of Father, Son, and Spirit. There's sometimes I visualize um, that I'm in, a, I'm in a park and Father's on a park, park bench there and I sometimes come up to him and I am, um, sometimes I kind of crawl to him. Other times I lay my head on his, his chest and just, and just enjoy his embrace. Uh, in fact, that's, that was the, the imagery this morning. Uh, that I had before I came to the, to the church building. So there are a lot of, that's what I do. I'm not saying that's what you have to do, but I'm saying that that for me is, makes it more personal and more real. But make the connection. That's, that's, the, that's the, the, the thing. And we're going to see that in Paul. But before we get to Paul's uh, prayer life, I want us to read Luke chapter 10. Somebody read verses 1 and 2, please. Jesus sends out the 72. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of, ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. This is pretty interesting to me. What do you think of the fact that before Jesus sent his disciples to talk to people about God, he told them to talk to God about people? What do you make about that? Which is very but I think it's Dietrich Bonhoeffer that said, you know, that very thing. Uh, talk to God more about them than you do them about God. And especially like when you're talking about praying for your kids or praying for people who don't know the Lord, you know, the tendency is to want to maybe overwhelm them or give them too much. And, and he, he said, do that. And then, uh, actually, Dallas Willard quoted him saying, then pick your spot. Mm -hmm. So, but I like that whole idea. It's you know, praying that God will show you the right ones. That's a little bit of what we were talking about a few minutes ago, Doug, with your son. In fact, I would encourage you to uh, make you know, your son and his family a regular part of the prayers in this class. If you would. What do you think about that? He said, before you talk to people about God, talk to God about those people. What do you think about that? Uh, it's a fascinating text right there because he's, he's got the same amount. He says, if you ask God to send workers out. <laughs> it's kind of a, just what you're talking about. You start talking to God about it. And there's, <laughs> he might say, well, what are you going to do? Yeah. 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 You're aware, I assume, I hope, because we have talked about it before, that in the in the beginning of creation, that the, the Genesis account says there was not, it doesn't say there was morning and there was evening. It says there was evening and there was morning, the first day, second day, so forth. 
what so what's easy to miss in that is that God the implication is God wants us to operate from rest to work not from work to rest in like fashion God wants us to operate from him to mission and not from mission to him. You understand what I'm saying? So anytime we get together and we're talking about, here's what we want to do. Here's what we ought to do. Here's, here's something that will uh, bless people and, and build the kingdom of God. What should always be the first thing we do? Go to God in prayer. Okay? He's, Jesus is sending out the 12 and 72 here. And he says, start with praying. Start with praying. Now, why would, why would that be? I mean, we all know what our mission is. So, so why would we need to pray? God knows what our mission is. He knows we're trying to do good things. So why would we need to stop and pray? We can wake up. Where to go? Okay. Preparation. Direction. Preparation. Well, like you said before, is that you're you're admitting that it's not you doing this. You're going to the, the Father for for that direction. But it's His work, not yours. You're just a hand. All right. I, I, I love again that imagery. I'm a tool. Okay. I'm a tool. I want to be, I want to be handled by the craftsman. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk to the craftsman about handling me as a tool. Well, okay, so we start there. Um, I start premarital counseling sessions. How do I start? Prayer. Why? Because I want God to be in charge. Well, I was just going to add that we also, in, in addition to direction and purpose and all that, we want his presence to go with us. Yes. So operate from God, from the from God being the center toward <clears throat> mission, not from mission toward God. Okay. Let him be the one in charge. And that's what we're going to see in Paul. So let's turn to Acts chapter 13 <clears throat> verses 1 through 3. Somebody read those verses please. Now that we're in <clears throat> the church at Antioch prophets the teachers Barnabas Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Serene, man of long, uh, long life friend <clears throat> of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work to which I have called them. Then, after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. Okay, as D.O. Moody points out, we are not told that the Lord ever taught his disciples how to preach, but he did teach them how to pray. What role did prayer play in the early church and in Paul's ministry in particular? Now, Paul, in our minds, is such a brilliant missionary that it may be hard for us to remember that Paul, in the beginning, was simply a member of the local church. And that the Holy Spirit set him apart to do mission work and to prophesy. So... Frequently, we read of the connection between the Holy Spirit and prayer. The Holy Spirit, Genesis 1-3, is the uh, active agent who is ready to carry out God's spoken words. 
It's our prayers that seem to trigger God's activity. What do you see in the early church when it comes to prayer? What do you see in particular about Paul and prayer? He was commissioned by God. Okay. He was commissioned by God. Identified. I appoint you. Okay. What else? Paul didn't say, I want to be a, I, I want to be a missionary. God said, I want you to be a missionary. Because it's, because it's really in these next verses that, that it kind of lays out Paul's um, reliance on prayer. Let's read those together. Who will read Romans 15, verse 30? Doug. Uh, Rick. Read it, Ephesians 6, 18 through 20. Who will read Colossians 4, 2 to 4? Colossians 4, 2 to 4. Melody. And 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 1. Okay, Jim. All right. Romans 15, 30. I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit, to join me in my struggle by praying to God for me. Okay, let that sink in just a little bit. Read that last few words again. <laughs> to join me in my struggle by praying to God for me. Join me in my struggle by praying to God for me. All right. Ephesians 6, 18 through 20. Praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance and be supplication for all the saints. <clears throat> And also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Okay, Paul had a mission. He said, I want you to pray for me that I'll do this boldly. Colossians 4, 2 to 4. <clears throat> Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. And pray also for us, too, that God may open the door for our message, so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ, for which I am in James. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Again, he's in chains. He wants, he, he feels a responsibility. He says, pray for me to speak clearly. Um, 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 1. Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified, even as it is with you. So what does Paul tell us about prayer, and what does Paul's teaching about prayer tell us about Paul? What does he say about prayer? He's the one. He, he's, he knows the power of it. He's, he relies on people's prayers. Oh, the strengthening and the clarity that I need to speak what God wants me to say in a way that will be understood. We what think, else? We think of Paul as so well spoken, well educated, intellectual. <coughs> we don't picture him as shy, and yet he's praying for those things. In spite of his human abilities, he's praying for those things pretty firmly. Yeah, I, I think it's easy to assume. Sometimes it, we we do this even amongst ourselves. Sometimes we see. I mean, I'll, I'll use me as an example. You see Dale as this fifty-seven-year-old guy who's been preaching for you know thirty-plus years, and the maturity level I'm at now. You you didn't know the kid. Okay? that God has been working on all these years. And it's easy to assume the same thing about Paul. Uh, it just came easy for Paul. It just came naturally for Paul. No, it didn't. That's why he's asking these things. And I'm saying that for this reason. I think sometimes we feel inadequate and ill-equipped 
just know if you feel that way, you're, you're in the majority. But God can use anybody if they'll make him, themselves available. Okay? And I think that's exactly the place that we ought to be. Yeah. Because it's it's like, man, pride gets right in the way so quickly and arrogance gets in there. And, and, and God's always, you know, he doesn't want us to think we did it. Yeah. You know, uh, and you just see that played out over and over and over and over again. Yeah. And, and so if you're in a situation where you need, you want to talk to somebody uh, about Christ, if you're in a situation where you need to correct somebody, if you're in, whatever it is, you may say, Lord, I don't, I don't know what to say. I don't know how the right way to handle this, but I know that you want me to do this. Give me what I need to say. Tell me how to do it in a way that glorifies you, okay? And then do it. Act. Don't allow fear to paralyze you. But I also want to add this. Even when you pray that, it doesn't mean that it will always turn out the way you want it to. Did it always turn out the way that... Um, that Jesus wanted it to, or Paul wanted it to. No. Let God do his work, and let him do his work through you, then let him deal with the outcome. I've said this before. Sometimes we are so concerned about controlling the outcome that if we can't get the, if we're not, Guaranteed, or we don't feel certain that we're going to get the outcome we want, we won't do anything. Well, that outcome may not come immediately either. That's right. That's right. And so we miss an opportunity because we're, I want the outcome immediately. And it may not come immediately. Well, I think, too, we hedge our bets sometimes. We're, we're afraid to just be real bold and ask God things because if it does, he doesn't give us what we think he should give us, and we're, we start questioning his power, you know. So sometimes we pray your will be done, not really, because we're hedging our bets. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Just in case you don't answer it the way I want you to. Or, or you know, I pray for whoever to be healed of cancer. And if he doesn't he answer, then I think that must say he can't. No problem, evil. It's just that. But it may be that he's got a bigger plan in mind. Yeah. Just trusting that his ways aren't my ways, and they're higher than mine. And, and while I may not understand it, I will someday. I'll use Larry English's uh, struggle with ALS. How many of you? How many of you know Larry? Uh, English. Well, he was one of our elders here. Developed ALS. Uh, we prayed for his healing. You know what Larry prayed for? Larry prayed to use his sickness as a platform to speak to others that he would have never had a chance to do otherwise. That doesn't mean he didn't want to be healed. And it certainly didn't mean that he didn't believe God couldn't do it. Because he believed God could do it. But he took the circumstance and said, I'm going to use this for God's glory. Yeah. I think in some ways, I have found through my prayer life that it, even as praying for others, it has led me to new understandings. Because of the ways that I've prayed, and if it hasn't worked out the way I wanted it to, you go back and say, well... It's how I wanted it to what I should have been asking for in the first place. Because um, we do a lot of times. I think I think a lot of it is because I'm in the medical field and I see this stuff every day. But sometimes the way that we look at healing is not the same way that God looks at healing. And that's a very different it's a very difficult concept for us all to understand because we all have a mortality. But death is the ultimate healer in a lot of situations. And that's a hard concept to handle too. And I think sometimes when we pray for the things that make sense on earth, 
it the process of praying for it continually also helps us understand that when what we want to come to fruition doesn't, it we kind of understand maybe why that wasn't God's will for that to be done. And so I think sometimes it actually, I think it matures my faith to pray sometimes. Because I can remember the thing, I mean, I pray with five-year-olds. <laughs> Everything is on a very black and white level, but sometimes there's this level of clarity that they have that we bog up a whole lot of stuff. And prayer in a lot of ways is my comfort zone with God to realize the things, the way I'm looking at it is not correct. So it's a conversation, but it's almost like you're talking to the, <laughs> I don't know, it's just a way to, to clarify and clear some things, because sometimes what you're asking for and what you're giving really are the same thing, you just don't see it that way. Okay. If my prayer as I request it is not answered as I wish it would be, does that change whether God is good or not? No. No. Does it change his character in any way? Yeah. No. And that's important for us to remember because I think that some people somehow connect the two. That if he doesn't answer as I wish, then he's he doesn't care about me or I'm not important or he's not good or he's not powerful. And, and we so we draw some wrong conclusions about God as a result of that. Now we typically want to then convince God to bend to our well, and really what God teaches us quite often is that he's trying to form us, conform us to his will for us. Exactly, exactly. And, and so one of the things that we, one of the practical things that we can take from what we've just read, the verses, um, I love it when people come up to me and they say, I'm praying for you. And then they'll ask me this question. What can I pray for you? What can I pray for you? In fact, I sent out a, a text to my children um, not too long ago. I'm going to do it again very soon. And say, I'm praying for you daily. Okay? I'm doing that. But what can I pray for you? Because Paul said, I want you to pray for me. And here are the things that I'm dealing with that I want you to pray for. Pray for me to be able to speak clearly. Pray for me to be bold. When, you, when you're praying for people in your life, ask them, what can I be praying for you? Okay? Uh, you know, I think he, it's also just his, uh, the, the Ephesians thing comes on the tail of him talking about our struggles not against flesh and blood and, and you know, the arm of God. I think it's just his... You know, prayer brings us into the reality of this world, and it's not a physical world, it is a spiritual world, and, and invites us into, a, you know, and there's power that's beyond anything physical that we're, we're tapping into. But I think there's also just the acknowledgement of that, you know, so it's a profound thing. Yeah, we're, 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 there's, there are things happening right around us right now that we don't see. <laughs> And that's what we really most need to be prepared for. And so that's what we need to be uh, mindful of and prayerful about. All right. Next question. Uh, both Romans 12.2 and 1 Thessalonians 5.17 talk about continuing in prayer. What keeps you from praying? Okay, what are the things that keep you from praying? Being busy. Busyness. Okay. Lack of dedication to him. You know, for the sake of time, I'm going to go ahead and, and since you mentioned that, here's some dis here's some things I want distractions. You know, sometimes I want to watch a ball game. Um, fatigue. I'm ready to go to bed. And I don't want to get up. Laziness. Uh, I don't want to put the effort into it. But here's the bottom line, because this is what Lisa is saying. In those moments, God is not important enough to me because if someone called, if one of my children called and said, you know, I've got, I've got something I need your help with, or 
a, a family member here at Greenlaw called and said, Dale, we need you for X. I do it. And so in those moments when I say, It's just not important enough to. I would say avoid it too. I think we don't want to think about situations that we don't want to, not ready to deal with it. Yeah. So, so, so I don't want to, I don't want to be brought that to my conscience, so I won't pray. So, a, a lot of times, that's why the discipline that Teresa talked about is so important. The discipline of prayer. Because you're going, to, you're going to have busyness, and you're going to have moments when um, there are distractions, and you're going to have moments that there are things that you don't want to deal with. But the discipline of prayer keeps you close to Him. Well, let me say, there's sometimes interruptions. We got a new puppy. And um, he, he would start barking, and I can't pray in the middle of barking. Um, and so I just pray for him. You know, Lord, make those dogs quit barking. And he did. Well, Lord, he did. Very good. I haven't had kids under five. <laughs> yeah, you know what I pray about? Please let him go to sleep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You, you got to pray to be able to pray. Yeah, you do. So what purpose did prayer have in Paul's relationship with God and mission for Christ? So he relied on it, but what? Why? Why would he be so reliant? It's it's affecting this area of us. You want to do what God wanted him to do. So it's like walking, uh, being set in spirit, knowing that I need to be spending my time with you. And it must be the most productive, you know, eternal kind of ministry. Here's what I want to make sure that you, you grasp this morning. I don't want us don't use God as our tool. Here's what I mean. Is it possible that there are times that we pray in order to use God and his power to get what it is? And it may be a wonderful thing that we're praying about. You know, we may be praying about somebody we're, we're hoping to lead to Christ. We may be praying about somebody who is sick. We may be praying um, any, about our own personal growth. But the danger sometimes is this, that we start using God as the tool for our building our kingdom rather than simply using prayer as an avenue to relate to and connect to and to love God. Second. All of a sudden, mission becomes more important than God. Uh, feeding the, the hungry becomes more important than God. Um, reaching the lost becomes more important than God. At some level, we can't simply use God as a tool to accomplish even good things. It has to, prayer has to be fundamentally about the fact that I love my Heavenly Father because He loved me first. You hear what I'm saying? God ain't our genie. He's not our genie, and we don't want to simply use him. We don't, we don't want prayer to be simply about stuff being done. We want it to be about our relationship with him first and foremost. And that's what we see in Paul. 
Remember Jesus, and I, I've already, I think I may have already used this example uh, earlier in one of the classes, is Jesus had ministry opportunities everywhere around him. And he told the disciples, get in the boat and go to the other side of the lake. People love you, but be gone. <laughs> and he went up on the mountain and spent with Father. Why would he do that? He, he could have done so much good ministry. Because even more important than good ministry is your relationship with your father. That's hard for some ministers to remember. Okay? Yeah. In Revelation, it talks about that our prayers are incense yes. to God. And I think if we just remember that, I mean, if we start out with giving him glory mm -hmm. and honor and power and talking about things that he's done. I mean, because that's what we're going to do in heaven is give him glory, so we ought to practice. Um, so anyway, but if we remember that it's incense to God, our prayers, then it's important <coughs> because it talks about that. Very good. Yeah, you your hand up. I was just going to say that uh, the, way that you, the way that I think about that is, is that we all, I think a lot of times we say, Lord, let me be successful in this so that I can glorify you. When we should be saying, let me glorify you and people will see. And I think when we take that approach, it seems to me like the things that last about how people really truly become understanding Christianity is yes, you can you can go on football stadiums and preach at people, but when you walk with them and you show them how he works in your life, that's really what brings people to God is they say, Oh, you don't have the perfect life, but yet you still you still follow this path. And so I think for me, that's what prayer does for me is it says, how am I going to show today how you're working in my life for others to see that you can work in theirs? So make sure that you start with him. Okay? Start with relationship with him. And from that, see what he tells you to do. Okay? Don't tell them what y'all can do. That's what we see in Paul. And that's what makes this his prayer request for Mark. All right, as usual, we are later than everybody else being there. But uh, we need to get Scott to the auditorium. So uh, we will, we will do that. thank you all.